Thank you, Elon. What Elon doesn't know is that I'm charging him personally, sending him to his home. Uh, every time I hear an introduction like that, which uh, of course uh, most of you probably know that have done any speaking, you get to write yourself, but it, it reminds me of the, the fellow that said to his wife, Honey, how many truly great men do you think there are in the world today? And she says, Well, I don't know, but I'm sure there's one less than what you think. <laughs> You know, George, George Bernard Shaw said he gave speeches not for speeches, but he gave speeches for the introductions. And I don't know what kind of speech you're going to get today, but I thought the introduction was well worth my being here. Uh, just before I, I came, uh, those who know me well know that I, I, uh, I don't dress up anymore. I, I work in very casual clothes. In fact, I just hate ties, and I'd like to know who invented the tie. I'd like to have him hung by it. but. Uh, serves no useful purpose, but I called my wife and I said, Honey, I've got to speak, speak today. Do you want to run a suit of clothes to me? And so she jumped in the car and brought a suit of clothes to me. And uh, she did everything but one thing. She, she brought me everything but a belt. So, so if, if I, I hope that if my pants drop down, it's the same time that I'm telling a joke, so I'll go away here thinking I'm a pretty good comedian. The format that I've chosen to use for my remarks is basically a story. I, I, it's the easiest way I know how to explain things. Basically my story, what I did and how I did it. I think that in success in any field, whether it's financial, whether it's with your family, the success goals you have there, whether it's religious, whether it's political, no matter what it is, there are some basic ingredients that go into all of them. I'm talking about general ingredients, and I would say those ingredients are three that I've kind of combined made four out of them, but they're really basically three. And the first one is goal setting. In fact, the, the name of this organization has financial planning in it. Planning is goal setting. Without a goal, and I, I think it's the absolute most important one, you can't do very much. If you don't set a goal as to where you're going, first of all, you don't know if you ever get there. But if you set that goal, once you set it firmly in your mind and on paper and it becomes a part of you, things start to happen inside your head and you start figuring out ways to accomplish that goal. In summary uh, of the other two, which I'll talk about a little bit, the other two ingredients, the second one is a game plan. You have to have a game plan, a formula, a plan of attack. And you've got to know that game plan works for you and for others, and it has some kind of statistical probability of working, a good statistical probability. And third one, which is, is absolutely, see, it's, you just have to have it, and that's the motivation to go out and do it. You can have a plan, you can have a great illustrious high plan, you can have the game plan, you know how to get there, you've read all the books, you've, you've talked to all the right people, you know how to get there, but if you don't have the motivation if you can't get out of bed in the morning, if you can't, if you can't get going. In fact, I know a fellow, by the, I won't give you his name, uh, in Denver, Colorado, who had all the motivational tapes, he had all the books, he had, he had everything, and he'd get all up in the morning, he'd get all worked up, he'd, he'd read his books, and he'd, he'd hear his motivational tapes, and he'd get all psyched up, and he knew what to do, but he'd never go out the door. You can't get there unless you have the motivation, and then put it into action, and the last one, is the determination, which is closely connected to, to motivation. And you can't read, I don't think you can read, of any successful person, whether, uh, financially or any other, any other area, whether it's a Jimmy Carter or Aristotle Onassis or Conrad Hilton, you cannot read any of these stories without seeing these ingredients, all of them present. The, game, or the, the goal, the setting the goal, the workable game plan, and the last one that I've combined into two, is the motivation to do it, and then the determination to carry out that motivation, to put that plan into action. Absolute, all of them are absolute necessities in, in any kind of success. And I, I kind of, let me just back up and say, I, I know I'm not speaking to a room filled with failures. Uh, I know some of you, I know some of you well, and I know that you've accomplished many great things, but, all of us can accomplish more, all of us can do more. And I'm sure some of you could be up here filling, filling this, this uh, position just as well as I can, assuming I do well. I set out with the goal, as he explained in the introduction, 
age 20 to hit, in, the, in my early 20s, to hit a million dollars. And I very quickly found out that my game plan was not any good. I was making uh, between three and four dollars an hour and I sat down, as many of us have, and figured out how many hours it would take to make a million dollars. We live, on average, the average person lives a half a million hours. That's from the time he was born to the time he dies. The average person, if he works about 45 years, eight hours a day, he will work about 90 to 100,000 hours in his lifetime. And there's no way at $4 an hour, I figured I had to be 124 before I made a million dollars. And I figured by age 20, 124, I, would, I, I wouldn't enjoy it. I mean, how many, guy, how many 124 year olds have you seen on the tennis court, or, let alone chasing women? That's not one of my avocations, by the way. I want to make that clear. <laughs> You can't make it on an hourly wage. I figured that out. I started figuring how, how it, what it would take commission-wise. In fact, even on an hourly wage, even you have to get up to $20, $25 an hour, you can't do it in a normal lifetime. Unless you, you know, if you live to 200 years, you can do it. Because you have to eat, you have to sleep, so you can't work around the clock. You can't work enough hours to make it that way. Figure it out for yourself. I looked at the commission business, the way it could be done there. And of course, you can make a lot of money in commissions. But I came to the realization that the best way for me was to make my money work for me as hard as I worked for myself. Now, you know all about that, but that was a real, you know, a, a brainstorm to me. I thought I was the first one to discover that for a while. Then I was inter introduced to the concept of compound interest as a way to make your money work as hard for yourself as you do. Compound interest, of course, we all know what that is. Compound interest is where you get interest on interest or return on top of return. If you take $1,000 and stick it in a bank at 5% interest, at the end of one year, what do you have? $1,050. Or did I hear somebody say, not very much? <laughs> At the end of the second year, when the compounding takes effect, if you're compounding annually, you have what? One thousand plus the fifty dollars that the bank or, or the return on the investment gave you, plus the compounded part of two dollars and fifty cents. You have a thousand of your own, fifty that they gave you, another fifty for the original thousand dollars, plus two dollars and fifty cents. So at the end of the second year, you have one thousand one hundred and two dollars and fifty cents. That two dollars and fifty cents can make anyone rich. The two dollars and fifty cents won't really, the five percent won't, but the concept will. In fact, at five percent it takes on a on thousand dollars after um, twenty-five years it's compounded all the way up to thirty-three hundred and eighty-six dollars. So 5%, and I realized that, that 5% compound interest is not going to make me any money. Because I wasn't going to live 500 years. So I looked around and played with many, many different rates of return, compound rates of return, to see what it would take based on the amount of money I had to start with. And I realized my money, what little I had, had to work very, very hard. And I played around with the different compound rates of return, and I learned some very fascinating, interesting things. In fact, let me just talk about that. And to make my point, let me demonstrate it by asking for two volunteers. First of all, volunteer, I want someone who, who would like to go to work for me for $1,000 a day for 35 days. Who would like to go to work for me for $1,000 a day for 35 days? <laughs> you want to come up here? I've got the thousand dollars right here. The, the fellow with the beard. Yeah, you. Here's a thousand dollars. Okay, he 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 volunteered. He's hesitating. He volunteered to come up here, and he doesn't know. I want to come right come right up here and stand, if you don't mind. He volunteered to work for me for thousand dollars a day, and he doesn't even know what he's going to do. I've got an old chicken coop that needs the manure shoveled out, and, and that's a ten hour a day job. Do you still want to work for a thousand dollars a day? Okay. Here's a thousand dollars. It's your money. There's one hundred, two hundred, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Jerry, keep an eye on him, okay? Some of you lock the door. <laughs> okay. Now I need someone else who would rather work. Now, how much is that after one year? I mean, one uh, thirty-five days. 
$35,000. Who would rather work for me for a penny a day compounded at 100% a day for 35 days? This fellow right here. Okay. A lot of people have done this maybe. But it really makes the point. Okay. Would you rather be in his shoes or his shoes? Who would rather be in his shoes? Raise your hand. Okay. He, he knows too. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's just figure what happens after 35 days. One day you got one cent, two cent, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, a dollar twenty-eight, two fifty-six, five dollars and twelve cents after ten days. You want to switch? Well, you, you only got five dollars and twelve cents after ten days. You still want the penny? This sounds like a quiz uh, show. No. <laughs> you want the penny? <laughs> okay. All right, that's after 10 days. I'm going to round down because I'm not too smart. That's $10, 20, 40, 80, 160, 320, 640, 1,000, 250. I rounded down. 2,500, 5,000. That's after 20 days. 10,000, 20,000, 40, 80, 160, 320, 640, a million, 250. I rounded down. 2.5 million, 5 million after 30 days, 10 million, 20 million, 40 million, 80 million, 160 million. That's enough. That's enough? That's enough. <laughs> okay, now that, that's, that's just on the last day. You get to add the whole thing up, and it adds up to about a third of a billion dollars. Okay, I didn't tell him this, but it was a contest you lost. Okay. You, no, 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 no. You won, and you get to keep the penny. <laughs> The point, it's more than a cute little trick, the point is the phenomenal, fantastic effects of compound rate, compound interest rate. Now, question, is it realistic to compound your money at 100% a day? Is it? No. If, if there is a way to compound it, tell me. I want to know. I've got a lot of dollars and I'll put to work. It's not realistic. But, and be careful with this one. Is it realistic to compound your money at 100% a year consistently for, say, 35 years? We'll, we'll make them years instead of days. Is it realistic? He says yes. Does anybody disagree? Many times people disagree. Who in this room has compounded their money at 100% or more consistently for more than one or two or three years? Raise your hand. Anybody? Okay, there's one. There's another one. I was down in Los Angeles, spoke to a thousand real estate investors, and I asked for hands on that, and I, I, I must have had 150 hands out of a out of thousand. I said 200%, I still had hands up, 300%, 400%, I got over a thousand percent, I still had hands up. And it seems ph ph phenomenally unrealistic, un unrealistic, but it's achievable. I did it consistently, and I'm still doing it consistently, and that's not to say that I might fail sometime, but I don't think so, for the last five and a half years at a much higher rate than 100% a year. And you, can you see what a, 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 a thousand dollars, take a thousand dollars at 100% a year and just take 11 years and you've got a million dollars. Now you say, well, yeah, when you get up in the big money, it's harder to compound it. Is it? The second million I made was a lot easier than the first and it came a lot faster because you have knowledge, you have experience and you have confidence, which is a big part of the formula. You have confidence to go out and, and do your thing, whatever your thing is. Okay, the next part of my success was really figuring out what the best vehicle was to try to get these higher rates of return. Okay, there, there were three parts of this to me. Let me turn my sloppy notes here. The vehicle, you had to find a vehicle that could do 100% a year. You had to find the get, the, uh, a vehicle, the second was a game plan that applied to that vehicle. And the third one, to get these higher rates of return, was you had to use leverage based on my experience. Now, I'm not saying everybody has to, I had to. If you've got a lot of money, you don't have to use leverage to, to have a handsome income but you had to use leverage. Let me take that one, last one first. What is leverage? Leverage is, well, everybody knows what a lever is. If you have a long enough lever, you can lift almost anything. If I had a 40-foot piece of 
aluminum here, I could take 10 people here and put them on the end of it and put a fulcrum down close to them, it'd have to be down by them, and I personally, single-handedly, could lift those 10 people. Everybody knows that. If the lever's long enough, I can lift those people. Now, financial leverage means that the lever would be what? It would be the use of other people's money. Some people say, well, that sounds illegal. <laughs> of course, we know it to be what it is. It means via loans. In my case, it was mortgage loans in real estate, which I'll talk about in a little bit. You put the, the 10 people up here that you're lifting represent in a financial leverage formula the assets that you're lifting up. Ten times, in this case, 10 times heavier than I am. I, pushing down on this leverage, represent what? My little bit of cash. And I can control all those assets with a little bit of cash. I'll give you a quick example. I'm trying not to run off the mouth too much yet. If you, I ask this question often, what investment have you invested in that has made you more money than any other investment? Most people will say, my home. I say, now don't, aren't you, shouldn't you learn something from that? How come you don't own some more homes, especially with the tax advantage of it? If you went out and bought a $50,000 home, just for sake of an example, and put minimum down payment down of $5,000, 10% down, which you can do, and borrowed $45,000, what would be the net effect, the results, after one year? If that house went up in value by 10%, what rate of return would you have? Anybody? 100%. You see that? That's right, 100%. $5,000 down, you owe forty-five. dollars it goes up in value by 10%, so now it's worth $55,000. $55,000 the value, you own $45,000. You owe $45,000. So your net equity is $10,000. You put in five, you now have 10. If you'd paid cash for that, you, what, what would your return be? Be 10%. Okay, when I, when I saw how this could work on an asset, and of course it has to be an appreciating asset in deference to the stockbrokers that are here. I was a stockbroker for five years and I couldn't find the appreciating assets except for when I went short. <laughs> Brokers know what I mean there. Then they appreciate it. Okay, if it consistently goes up in value, you can have these higher rates of return. Take just a 2% return. That is a 2% increase in value on a $100,000 piece of property. You put on a 10, 10 to 1 leverage, a $10,000 down payment, $90,000 balance, it goes up 2% in value, you've just returned 20% on your money. Now, if I'm losing you, you can always go out in my book, buy my book and look, read the rest of, about that, and the details of it. Okay, people say, well, how about the, the payment? If I go out and buy a bunch of houses or duplexes or apartments, who's going to make the mortgage payment? There's people out there ready, willing, and able to pay that payment. I said that to a big audience in Waterloo and, and, and I could hear mumbles of who, who, and say, I want to know. Are there any, is there anybody in here that's a tenant? Oh, we love you. I hope they didn't charge you to get in. <laughs> they shouldn't, you know, because you're doing great things for the landlords. Because they, the tenants, or the, these beautiful people are making not only the mortgage payment, the principal payment, but the interest payment in most cases, the repairs, the, the, the insurance, and sometimes there's even cash left over, which we call cash flow, which we put in, in the HIP National Bank back here. Okay, that's not even to mention the tax advantage. Okay, when I was introduced to this, I really got excited because I really could see what could happen. Sure, I have the fears, the normal fears. Well, how about if my tenants move out, or how about if this happens, or, you know, I can't make the mortgage payment. And, but, in reading a lot of material, looking at different people's success, I could see that the odds were in my favor. You never can eliminate risk totally. You know, I mean, we live in a, it's a, it's a, it's a risky business just living. But I saw what could be done in theory. And then, with my, with, I had a great determination because I'd set this goal. And I wouldn't let myself forget the goal. And I wouldn't let myself be talked out of the goal. And believe me, there's a lot of people, as I'm sure many of you, the successful people here know, that are, are trying so hard to talk you out of it. Oh, you can't do it. You know, I know Joe, he did it, and, and he lost his shirt. And, you know, you, you hear all these, these stories of, of, of fear. 
there are many, 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 many people who have done it. Thousands are doing it. Not only, in, and I'm not saying you have to do it in real estate. If you can find a consistently appreciating asset where you can use leverage, it's particularly nice though in real estate because you can do some controlling things. You can control those assets. You can turn a small nest egg into a fortune over a given period of years. So the younger you are, the better chance you have, the more years you have to do it. Some people say, well, I'm, I'm 55, you know, I can't start now. Uh, you know, it's too late in life. Uh, it happens if I go start doing this and change my occupation or get involved in this, it'll, it'll take too long. It reminds me of a friend of mine who, who had an employee that worked for him who was 45 years old. And he came to my friend by the name of a guy, guy by the name of Gary Halbert who lives in Santa Monica. And he said, Gary, I would really want to quit working for you. And I re what I really want to do and I've always wanted to do is I want to go and get my, my uh, law degree. But I figured if I quit now, and go get my law degree. By the time I get my law degree, I'll be 49 years old. And my very wise friend said to him, which is a classic, he says, how old will you be four years from now if you don't get your law degree? <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. You know, no one's too late to change in midstream, I, I don't think. If you want to do something, you know, you, you want to research it, and you want to plan, you want to set goals, and you want to know something about it, but then have the motivation and the determination to go do it. Let me just, uh, I've tried to take an hour and a half speech and crunch it down to, to, to a half hour, which is, is hard, and, and I'm leaving out a few parts, but let me, let me tell you another important ingredient, in my opinion, in the, in the form of a story. There's a fellow, the story is told, uh, it's by Henry Leon Wilson, it's a story written in, in 1912, I believe, about a fellow by the name of Bunker Bean. Some of you might be familiar with it somewhat. Bunker Bean was born in poverty. His parents died when he was young, and he found himself alone in the world with, with non-education, in rags, and, and mainly, the, the biggest point here is, he was afraid of everything. He was afraid of, of other people, of social situations, especially of business situations. He works as a factory worker. Uh, he was afraid of himself. He was afraid of everything. He moved into a cheap boarding house where he met a spiritualist median. And the spiritualist median convinced Bunker Bean that just like we cast off our old shoes, that we cast off our old, old bodies, and that we are reincarnated, and we lived in a former life as another person. Bunker Bean wasn't very ed well educated, and he really believed this. And this, this medium said, for a small price, I will tell you exactly who you were in your former life. And, and Bunker, he thought this was, sounded great, so he gave the man the money, and, and this medium sat down and started to explain to him that he, lowly Bunker Bean, was none other than Napoleon Bonaparte of France in his former life. And Bunker Bean was so ill-educated that he believed it. He had some doubts, but he believed it. And so he thought, how could that be? He says, I, I fear everything. I'm afraid of my own shadow. And, and what I, little I know about Napoleon, he was a magnificent general. I mean, people, he won battles uh, without even fighting them. Cities would, would uh, ar opposing armies would, would run just at the rumor of, of Napoleon coming. How could I be what I am now, being what I used to be? The spiritualist mediums quickly explained this away by saying that the world travels in these great karmic cycles. There's a period of ascendancy and a period of descendancy. And when you, uh, right now, you're, you're living in a period of descendancy. And when you were Napoleon, it was in a period of ascendancy. So all the positive qualities and the strengths of courage and, and uh, organizational ability and all these other things were prominent then. And now the opposite is true. But, he says, I've got good news for you. We're just starting into a period where the, we're, we're moving into the period of ascendancy. So Bunker Bean, with this information, he went to the library and he checked out all the books that he could find on Napoleon. And he went home and he started to read them. There in his, his little two second floor uh, apartment, dingy apartment with a single light bulb burning, he read till one, two, three, four o'clock in the morning. And he was just, just totally enthralled and mesmerized as he read about Napoleon. And you can see how this could happen. If you really thought that was you, 
For you would want to read every single line, wouldn't you? I would. And he read every single book that had ever been written on Napoleon. And as, as he started to read these things, as he started to run these thoughts, these great thoughts and these great actions that Napoleon had done and experienced, some things started to happen up here in Bunker Bean's mind. He started to act like he was Napoleon. He stood taller, he dressed better. To make a long story short, he started moving up in his, his factory where he became the, the president, where he, he dressed the part, he acted the part, he played the part. He, he was a very organized person. He had great, he, he was to, he, he had set this goal to become what Napoleon was in wartime, to become now what Napoleon was as a businessman. He wanted to be the, the top in business and he knew he could because he had read what he had done before and he did things like he, he would plan and, and strategize in his mind and he'd try to win the battles of business in his mind before he ever left to go out in the world of business like Napoleon as you remember Napoleon it was said that he won his battles in his tent before he ever took the field and to Napoleon to think was to act and so Bunker Bean tried to, to, uh, to uh, bring this quality into his, his everyday living and business life. But then the great day of awakening, the day that Bunker Bean found that the spiritualist medium was a phony, a fraud, a fake, had let him down the path just for money. And Napoleon was crushed. He was totally devastated. But then he realized the most important part of it all, that it didn't matter. It didn't matter that he had been lied to because because he was tricked he started to believe in himself he believed in himself to the point nobody could talk him out of it he had formed the habits of success he had done the right things that had become part of him to the point that he was what he thought about and he thought himself to be a great person and he was to me, there's a great message and a very in, important ingredient in success in that story. You have to believe in yourself. But I'm convinced as you set a goal, and the reason the goal setting so, works so well is if you see the vision up here of what you can do and you work backwards to what you are right now, assuming you have a vision of something up here, then you can figure out step by step how you get there. And then that game plan, to formulate a game plan, and to have the motivation and the determination and that very important belief in yourself. I think now is the time to get started. A lot of people run around in real estate, for example, today and they say, well, you know, that's easy for you to say four or five years ago you started and things have been so nice now and, and it's, it's a different market now. Realtors, is it a buyer's or seller's market here in Salt Lake right now? Anybody? A seller, is it easier to sell or easier to buy? What? Sell? Sell, right. That's what everybody says. It doesn't matter where I go, it's a seller's market. Because it has been a good market. But I submit to you, things are not always what they appear to be. It kind of reminds me of the, of the doctor who, who uh, walked into, or the, the fellow that walked in the doctor's office and he, and he, and he said, doctor, I got to back up. He walked in the doctor's office and the doctor says, what's wrong? Can I help you? And the guy said, or the guy took off his hat and, and uh, there's a great big bullfrog sitting on his head. And the doctor says, oh my word, what happened to you? When did you first notice this condition? And the bullfrog says, it all began with a wart on my rear end. <laughs> Things are not always as they appear to be. I'm convinced if you have the right game plan, you can succeed in whatever you attempt to do. Thank you, I appreciate your time being here. appreciate that, Mark, and perhaps the audience has some questions they'd like to ask, and if so, Mark said he'd try to field them. Are there any questions that you'd like to address to him? All right. Mark made the comment that things are not always as they appear to be right after he made the comment that it was a seller's market. Are you elaborating on that? I'm glad you brought that up. I really didn't finish my point. Which, you know, the best speech you give is always the one that you think of just as you sit down. <laughs> I think that five years from now, people will look back 
and say the same thing as they're saying now. I think it's a buyer's market. I do agree it's tougher to buy now, but there's still a lot of bargains around. In fact, I told an Ogden audience just recently, I asked them the question, the same question, you, know, you give the same speech over a few times, and they said, uh, no, it's a seller's market. And I said, that's funny, I just, I just bought a million dollars worth of property in the last six weeks here in Ogden, what I figure at least 10% under the market value. It, it takes work, and, I, and the point is, I think it's a buyer's market now, even though most people think it's a seller's market. Things aren't really what they appear to be at, at our time frame right now. Mark, how do you react to uh, some persons feeling that there is going to be a, a real estate bust? Uh, they keep projecting that. They've been doing that for last year. Well, that's the nice thing about being a, a prophet of dooms. You can always say, well, it's coming, it's coming. Uh, in the meantime, you're, the, the inflation rate just robs you of everything you have. Now, I have two philosophies on that. First of all, when buying an appreciating asset, I don't buy it on the come. That is, I don't buy it based on what the cash flow is going to be two years down the road from now. I have, it has to make sense today where I have, where I'm at least paying the mortgage payment and, and hopefully, depending on the down payment, a good, a good return on my investment. The second part of my philosophy is, if we have a super bust, and it depends on how big a bust we have, I mean, if we have what some prophets of doom have yelled about for years, another depression, it doesn't matter whether your money is in, you know, whether your hundred grand or whatever you have is in a savings and loan drawing six or seven percent, or whether it's in real estate or whether it's in the stock market, at least based on history. And, and I, I would rather take that risk, and I do think that that risk is very nominal. The biggest thing to realize about the depression, for those of you who don't know, most of the mortgages during the depression were short-term mortgages they were with a lot of balloons. That is, you'd, you'd finance your place for, I don't know this from experience, I, I read about it. Uh, for those, that, I don't know if anybody's old enough to have had a mortgage then, but uh, very common was a five-year mortgage, a two-year mortgage, and then they would balloon to be all due and payable, and then you'd have to refinance it. And what happened during the Depression is you got to the, the balloon part, and if it happened to hit 1932 and go to the bank and say, I want to refinance the bank, if the bank was in business, the bank would say no. And so then the bank would take the property over. How's your book selling? Oh, just phenomenally well. Uh, uh, people, I've been accused many times of, uh, of uh, they say, oh, I don't think you made any money in real estate. You made it all on your book. Uh, <laughs> I wrote a book somewhat in defense. I, I had so many people asking me questions of what I'd done. I decided to write a book so I don't have to tell the story over and over and over again. But it took off. Ten times better than my wildest uh, expectations of, of uh, what I ever, you know, ever dreamed. And, and those of you who know me know that that's true. I see Jerry down shaking his head. He he knew me before I uh, wrote a book. You know, it's funny. Before you write a book, you just mark and you don't know nothing. As soon as you write a book, everybody thinks you're a genius and an expert. But I'm gonna I'm gonna let them think that. That's a, that's fine. I love it. <laughs> yes. Yes, we are. Uh, you have to look harder now than you did three, four years ago. But realize one thing: three or four years ago, you could find the one, you could find properties that were lower. Uh, I mean, bigger bargains. But financing was much tougher to come by three or four years ago. Who anybody that was trying to finance re income property three or four years ago? Uh, we're still doing it. Um, Sometimes with difficulty, but we're still doing it, and we, uh, we still recommend it, especially for those that have big tax problems. Boy, you talk about tax shelter. Uh, it's phenomenal, the tax shelter that you can get, and I hope there's no IRS agents here. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, does this work, the real estate program work equally well in all parts of the country, or is it something that works better out here in the West, Salt Lake City? Uh, where do you do most of your investing? We've done most of it here, although we're buying, uh, we bought piece of a property in Mississippi we were looking at one in Illinois and okay he asked if it if my philosophy and formulas are uh, best suited for the western region as far as uh, the returns uh, uh, and the success uh, the states or places that have growth population are obviously better because you have a constant uh, demand that's growing for housing uh, California has had a phenomenal I mean our success is, is nothing compared to some of the uh, returns in California. Their, their market is just totally wild. In fact, I, I would generally recommend it to stay clear of it because they, they just uh, have gone to the point of insanity. But uh, we're, we're buying properties uh, in, in Illinois, Mississippi, uh, uh, 
which I don't re recommend for, for people that are just starting out, I recommend to try to stay in your own backyard where you can look and see and watch the properties. But when you, when you get more dollars to, to play with, you can go buy the bigger properties and, and depend on other people to manage and oversee them. Uh, but uh, I would not buy property uh, of the variety of, of uh, uh, residential housing in New York City, for example, or any place that has rent controls. It just is really devastating. Uh, New York, as you may have read recently, had torn down, they, they tore down 10,000 old buildings, 10,000 buildings, not units, because the, uh, the property managers or the owners would abandon the buildings because of the rent controls. Um, so. Any other questions? Super leverage. Okay. Super leverage for those who, what was your question? Do you want me to explain it or, I'm sorry. What did you, how do you return, figure your return on investment? That's, that's a good question. You, you really can't. Uh, uh, super leverage for those who, who haven't read the book. And, uh, I, I determine, I, I mean, I classify anybody that hasn't read my book is, is impoverished. Uh, so, but anyway, <laughs> super leverage is where, where you buy a property, let's say a $100,000 property, and when you buy it, you put, or shortly thereafter, you put $10,000 or any amount of money in your pocket and still own the building. In other words, you 100%, you 110% finance the building. Those of us who've done it say, yeah, it can be done. And those who've never done it, they say, oh, you can't do that. You can do it, I'll tell you. Uh, it's not easy, and they don't jump out at you. You have to find them, and you have to work a deal. But you can't, when you super leverage, if you buy a 100000 building, and you don't put any down, and plus you put money in your pocket, there's no way to figure your return on your investment, since you don't have an investment. You not only don't have an investment, but you have cash in your pocket. Uh, we don't worry about how to figure the return on that. We just, <laughs> just enjoy it. <laughs> Well, uh, of course, the larger the leverage, the, the smaller the cash flow. But a person starting out with, with, uh, with not a great uh, credit situation can still have great success, and that's where I started. What it takes is, is, uh, is a good tongue, some, some salesmanship. And the biggest source of uh, financing that I always look for, uh, toward is the owner. I always try to get him to finance all of it or at least part of it. And, and one comment aside, since I noticed there wasn't any bankers here, bankers are really hurting themselves in the last five years by refusing or being very tough to deal with on financing properties. I mean, they're tough, even for me today. Uh, they want an arm and a leg, plus they want your wife's arm and a leg. You know, they, they just want to, and anybody that's done much with bankers know what I'm talking about. What they're doing is they're hurting themselves because it's forcing the buyer and the seller to finance it themselves. And there is, there's millions and millions, hundreds of millions of dollars that are being used in that method. That is, the banks are being excluded almost totally, and sometimes totally, and the financing is worked out between you and the seller. And, and that's a very good situation. If you've got a guy that's 70, 75, and he, he's tired of, of, of business, and he just wants to retire, and he's got a million dollar property, say, that's free and clear, which is very common with, with people that have had it for a long time, it's an ideal situation for him to finance 90% of that or 95% or, or in many cases he'll finance the whole thing if he believes in you and you can put up your house for extra security if you want if he believes in you and it's a good thing for him too isn't it depending on what he wanted to do with the money if he wanted to take that million and go stick it in a CD or stick it in a, a long term uh, bond or saving, you know, savings account you can give him the same kind of return by your payments to him and the interest rate you pay him Well, we've got some people that represent different, uh, different interests in the room, and if I said absolutely no, it would offend them and it wouldn't really be true. 
I saw about ten hands of life insurance people. I'm not. I'm not going to touch that one. Um, the, uh, let me just answer it with a, a general answer. Any appreciating asset that can consistently appreciate that you can use leverage on. I have happened to have found that real estate. And when I talk about real estate, I'm talking about income producing properties. I'm not talking about raw land. You can make a lot of money in raw land, but the risk is commensurate and there's not a big, there's not hardly any tax advantage. But I, you know, if, if the stock market starts looking good, I'll, I'll move, move that direction. But I, I, um, I think for, for the time being, real estate is the best place. And legally, I mean, because of the tax laws, there's so many great advantages to that. Now, there might be other, other areas. Of course, some people have done it with corporations, buying and selling corporations, buying the right corporation to leverage themselves. Uh, if you want to read a fascinating book, read the book um, The Magic of Mergers by Mushalom Rickless, who is the chairman of the board of Rapid America, a billion and a half dollar company, who started with absolutely nothing. He didn't have a dime. He was a refugee from uh, Tel Aviv. Any other questions? Do you want to sell my books on the side? <laughs> What's your business? Insurance. Insurance. We have, we have literally, in fact, we're, we're publishing a book with this. We have literally hundreds, in, and by the end of next month, month, since we're soliciting these stories, we will have thousands of stories just like that. Because that's the big thing people say, ah, you know, how do I start with nothing? Can I really do it? I have these fears, and to overcome them, we need more stories like that. If you want to write yours down, we'll put it in the book. Single family resident, I, I say this with a little bit of resi uh, reluctance because we, uh, when I say we, I've got a staff now that does nothing but go and buy property, but we are buying a lot of single family residents uh, here on the west side. Uh, uh, there are a lot of opportunities. There's a lot of headaches with a lot of single family uh, residences, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of great returns there and there's some advantages. I, I would recommend if someone who's, who doesn't have much cash to start there with a small property, get their feet wet, find out what the tenant problems. And of course, I've all talked about all the good things. There's, there's bad things. I mean, uh, there's tenants that give you problems, that, that freeload, that won't pay their rent. And of course, most of, the, most of the stories you hear about them are exaggerated. But there's some real live problems there that either you have to handle or an agent for you. Uh, so it's not all, nobody goes out and makes a million dollars easily. There, there is an easier uh, way. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Mark, on behalf of IAFP, we want to thank you and all of you who are in attendance. There was one item we should have had on here, the company name that you represent. If you'd put that on there, and then you may either leave it at the table or take it back and leave it with one of the two lovely ladies, and they'll take it from you either way. But please put your company name on it and have it filled out. Thank you for being in attendance. We appreciate it. Have a good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, you have just heard a talk by Mark Oliver Haraldson.